What we did in these research pools is we actually divided these 12 pools and uh, four spas into sections where we put in different uh, material mixes. What we're trying to do is figure out all these different theories we talked about. If calcium chloride is a problem, if uh, troweling uh, too many times is a problem, is lubricating water is a problem. And in one section, we would install plaster with no calcium chloride, we use no lubricating water, and we'd trowel it four or five times as smooth as we could. And in the section right next to it, we would have some calcium chloride, troweled a little bit uh, more often with lubricating water. And we would do so many different combinations trying to eliminate what's the potential cause. In these different pools, we would have different water chemistries going on from a very balanced water where it's non-aggressive to very aggressive or corrosive water. Fascinating results, and they came out the same year in, year out. We did six years of protocols, and not only from we want to find out what's causing it and reproduce it over and over again, but what solutions we can come up with. Very interesting what we came up with, and it was uh, not a surprise to a lot of us, but in this picture you can see uh, four different slides. This is the same plaster out of the same mixer load put into four different swimming pools. On the top right corner, you see a very nice white, very acceptable looking pool plaster finish. That is the exact same plaster as in the three other slides. On the top right corner, that was kept in a very balanced pool water where it was slightly on the scale side. The other three were aggressive. Uh, one was very aggressive. Uh, you see on the top left, a little arrow pointing at a little spot of uh, spot etching surrounded by uh, little highlights of white around check cracking. And it's taken on a darkening background, as you can see. We, we found out a lot of this was what we call moisture entrapment. And that was a real common thing to see in a lot of the spot etching uh, scenarios where you'd get some darkening around that. Now, we understand it's basically just water being interacted with that soluble compound. Let's revisit these theories all of a sudden and, and find out what is and what isn't. We looked at supplementary, supplemental lubricating water. That had little to no effect on any of these tests whatsoever. If anything, the lubricating water allowed the trowel passes by the finishers to uh, glide and compact better. As a matter of fact, in our documents from the National Plasters Council, both in our technical manual and in the American uh, National Standard for Plastering and Swimming Pools, we talk about using lubricating water, which is very acceptable practice uh, to uh, the pool plastering trade. Unfortunately, some people have confused uh, some literature and some uh, language and through ACI and the Portland Cement Associated where it says lubricating water is not advisable. Well, that was really taken from concrete technology or for concrete finishing. Concrete is much different than pool plaster. Concrete is three and a half to four inches thick and when the concrete is poured the aggregate itself settles down and creates water being pushed to the surface which is called bleed water and that is something that you don't want to add more water to and trowel in uh, that would be called retempering water that's not necessarily anything you'd want to do we don't have that with pool plaster when pool plaster dries you're having the gunite or the substrate suck moisture you have away from it you have the atmospheric Her temperature around the top of the plaster coming in contact with the air, taking moisture, and the plaster is only about a quarter to three quarters of an inch thick, much different than concrete. So you need some water to be added to it uh, to control the drying, uh, for trowel lubrication, very acceptable. Doesn't apply to pool plaster whatsoever. The next one was too much calcium chloride or a setting agent, that if too much calcium was added to it, it could cause that spot etching. Uh, we found in our testing that when we added calcium chloride, it had almost no effect whatsoever uh, to the spot etching. As a matter of fact, uh, the more calcium we added, the harder the plaster got. And sometimes it seems it has slightly less spot etching, but not enough to be uh, documented as, as anything that would help it. The problem with calcium chloride is if you add too much to it, it can create a, a shading difference. That it would be a little bit more of a green hue or a tint, or if it dries so fast you couldn't get a proper pool finish on it. So calcium chloride wasn't the culprit. Either. Starting to fill the pool too soon was another one. Uh, that was a silly one that we kind of threw out early, but we had to look at it and see. Like with the pool that we're gonna investigate behind me, uh, you can see the lot of spot etching or the majority of the spot etching is on the upper part of the pool, uh, the upper walls and the steps. We don't fill the pools from the top down. We fill them from the bottom up. And you start to fill them after the initial set. 
So that spotting occurs everywhere. Uh, the areas that take water on last in the pool to the water that gets uh, covered first on the floor and down in the bowl. So we can never find an instant where delaying the water fill had any bearing on spot edging whatsoever. The next one was excessive trowel passes. We looked at that theory too. That had uh, no bearing also. As a matter of fact, the uh, harder and denser we uh, compacted that material, but it didn't eliminate it. It was still there. It just side by side, it just looked like a better product the harder you can trowel it. Next theory we're looking at is mixing pigments and calcium chloride together. Um, there's information out there by one of the pigment manufacturers that they don't recommend mixing calcium with pigments. The reason they do that is it's really it's recommended for gray concrete. Gray concrete is not pool plaster. There's a big difference. They recommend you don't mix calcium and pigments together because, for instance, if, say, you want a San Diego buff color, that the calcium uh, mixed with the pigments will take it a shade off. Now, why does that happen with concrete and not pool plaster? Well, concrete has a product in it called ferrous oxide. That is the component in gray cement that makes gray cement gray. Uh, that is not in white pool plaster or white cement. Uh, when it comes in contact with ferrous oxide, calcium can cause some shading variances from the pigment. Nothing to do with spot etching, and unfortunately this has been extremely misquoted, either just from a lack of understanding uh, cement science or what the original pigment manufacturers intended. The next theory we looked at was too high of a water to cement ratio. Uh, since water is a component mixed into the cement that starts all these reactions, uh, a, a water cement uh, ratio is very important. The more water you make, actually, the more calcium hydroxide is produced, which is the most soluble component. But in pool plaster, if you do mix too much water and the plaster becomes so wet or so soupy, it can't be delivered or can't be troweled very well. So even with the wettest material that is installed, you might get a 27% calcium hydroxide into the uh, mix formula as compared to a very thick lower water cement ratio, you might get 24%. Uh, percent. Either way, this doesn't change the microstructure of calcium hydroxide. From 24 to 27%, this won't change how calcium hydroxide is uh, affected by the water. It just might create a little bit more, um, but not a lot. So the water cement ratio didn't seem to have any bearing on whether the pool would spot etch or not. It just create a slightly um, insignificantly more calcium hydroxide. And then last is the uh, aggressive pool water theory. Well, this seemed to be the most important part of us to focus on and look at. Calcium hydroxide soluble. If the water, the pool water, is aggressive, and we're going to talk about what that means here in a moment, it will start to dissolve these products. If the water is not aggressive, it will not dissolve it. Very simple. So maintaining a balanced pool water seemed to be the number one most contributing factor to stop spot etching from even occurring and uh, to create that nice dynamic white plaster that we're looking for that's unmarred and unspotted. So taking all these considerations, looking at all the different parameters and theories that we seem to know that the water chemistry was the most contributing factor. Now, with that being said, that takes us to the final point of the important facts we need to know, are there solutions? Absolutely, there are solutions. And the whole idea behind the research at Cal Poly was not only to find out what's causing it, but what can we do to prevent it and stop it and to create a happy customer. My son recently gave me a book uh, called Extreme Ownership. And we believe as an industry, we need to take ownership of everything we do. From a pool plaster's perspective, I need to take ownership of everything I can do to control a good product for my customer, from delivery, to education to the customer, what my product performances are, to the actual installation. And uh, so what we can do as far as the solution from our end, and I think the industry at large from pool plasters, builders, is to let the customer know what can be done from the material side to prevent this uh, spot etching from happening. Well, number one, we know that, that calcium hydroxide is extremely soluble. Is there anything we can do to make it not soluble? Well, yes, there is. There's a product we can put in called a pozzolan. Pozzolans have been around for centuries. Matter of fact, the Romans used to use pozzolans when they built their aqueducts and cisterns. When they realized that a lot of the water that was going down there was corroding and dissolving uh, their cement mortar makeups that lined these. And so they actually added a volcanic fly ash, which is a form of a pozzolan, 
into their cement mortar mixes to help preserve uh, that cement. A lot of those aqueducts are still standing today. They were so durable. Well, in the pool plaster uh, industry, we have pozzolans that we add uh, to pool plaster. Most everything we put in nowadays has a po pozzolan there, and that converts the uh, soluble calcium hydroxide into a very dense calcium silicate hydrate material. That's the harder cement product we're looking for. That's the number one thing we need to educate our customers on and let them know that's available. The next thing we need to do is get rid of that soluble calcium carbonate, that marble sand. You saw how easily that dissolved in my example earlier on. Quartz aggregate is arguably 10 times harder and much less soluble and non-reactive. So we can take that compound out and put in a much denser, harder aggregate. Or we can go into the pebble finishes, these higher performance finishes where all the cement compounds are taken off the surface. We have these inert, non-reactive stones at the surface that doesn't show any spot etching whatsoever because there's nothing on the surface to really spot etch. And then we can actually put in even uh, stronger pigments that are less reactive uh, to water chemistries also. So we have to take ownership of the products we put into our pools, educate the customers what we can do from that end. The other side of it is obviously is on the maintenance side and the water side, the environment that these products live in. Uh, taking ownership on that side is the uh, serviceman, the homeowner, or whoever the agent is taking care of that water has to understand certain parameters that makes water aggressive. Uh, number one is on the startup. When we originally fill the pool, who takes care of that water that first week to two weeks? Um, in our company, we do what's called an initial water treatment, where we actually come in and we balance that water out as quickly as possible, get the calcium hardness levels in that water up to a place where that water is not going to start breaking down and dissolving these soluble hydrating compounds. Um, the next thing to understand is how do you know when water is aggressive and it's not? Uh, that's what we call the saturation index. The saturation index is an index or a uh, formula that's looked at to understand, and it's in all your test kits, when the water is either on aggressive side or a uh, scale side. Okay, measuring the saturation index is crucially important. One of the compounds in measuring the saturation index is the cyanuric adjustment. That's the conditioner level in the water has to be thrown into that measurement to get an accurate reading. So often when that measurement is above 100 parts per million, it throws off the uh, accurate reading of the alkalinity. Um, there's an adjustment factor. In this particular sequence we show, uh, the pool water is measured at uh, measured alkalinity at 100, calcium hardness at 400, and the pH at 7.2. That gave a saturation index reading of a negative 0.1, which is almost zero. But when we threw in the cyanuric acid level, which was at 280 parts per million, which is 200 parts higher than it should be, uh, we have to throw the factor of that high cyanuric acid in there. And th when you put that cyanuric adjustment level on the total alkalinity, as you can see, there's an adjustment. The alkalinity was actually at 27, and you throw instead of 100 alkalinity a 27, that brings your saturation index all the way down to a negative 0.7, which is an extremely aggressive environment. If you don't understand that and you look at just the normal measurements, you think you're at a very balanced condition. And in fact, we weren't because the cyanuric acid adjustment was not taken into effect. That's another very important taking ownership of understanding how all those components work. Now in the IPSA basic training manual, it instructs that that measurement needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, the APSP serviceman's manual and also the Taylor test kits booklet also recommends that that's being done because when those things do happen, you get a very corrosive water environment. And it does say in all those manuals, including the National Plasters Council, that you will have a corrosive environment which starts dissolving plaster. The next thing we need to look at is the test kits themselves. And it's very interesting at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, when we went through all of our testing, we noticed that a lot of our test kits that we were using were uh, not quite jiving with the water that we were using at the university for exact measurements. As a matter of fact, we did two years of study on those, and one of them, we went to five different universities throughout the United States to uh, not only test the accuracy, but the precision and consistency of test kits. Because if it's so important we understand the measurements going into the saturation index, we have to understand that our test kits are accurate. And we found some variation in those. Um, we published all the, the results on those, and it's online at the National Plasters Council website. 
if you want to see that uh, test kit uh, research. Very fascinating. But we also found out, as you can see in this picture, that some of the test kits were uh, showing you some readings that weren't exactly what you'd want to see. For instance, in this one particular graph, we have uh, the same manufacturer with uh, several different of his test kits testing the exact same water. And this was just the alkalinity alone. And we had anywhere from 140 parts per million all the way to 80 from the same test kit. And if alkalinity is so important, we need to know exactly where it is that we have to uh, get a good calibration of our test kits. And that is very doable. So taking complete ownership on all this, we have to understand our materials. We have to understand our water, how it interacts with those materials in order to get us a successful uh, product that we can deliver to have a happy customer. Um, thank you for taking the time to be educated on all this and be informed. My name's Alan Smith. Thank you for joining me.